Can you hear me okay? Brilliant, fantastic. I'm trying a different audio system. See if it works any better. And if I can get my volume up on this. Can you try saying something? Just see if I can hear everybody. Hi, can you hear me? Hmm. Sorry, can you hear me now? This, uh, not sure what's going on here. I'll try this instead. Hang on. Can you say now? Ah. Yeah, can you hear me? Ah, excellent. Great. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm trying a different way of uh, recording. Uh, right. That hasn't worked up there, but I'm going to try to get to work okay. Okay, I feel be all right. Sure. Okay. Um, ah. so we've got some people coming in. Just get myself connected on this end. Okay. So fingers crossed, everyone can hear me and uh, and see me as well. Hopefully, you can see me. Thank you so much. Excellent. <laughs> I'm switching the audio to the other device. Hopefully, that will lead to a, a better, a non-corrupted recording. Uh, okay. So everyone's dialing in at the moment. Um, I've got, uh, let's put in the chat gone. Oh yeah, there's the chat. So if you have any questions as normal, uh, please ask them in the chat. Um, and if you've got uh, the week four problems in front of you, that'll be good as well. And we'll just wait a couple of minutes as normal while everybody, while everybody dials in. Hope you've all had a good week. Um, obviously it's, uh, same old complications as uh, as previous weeks. Now, I understand that a lot of you will have had a fairly busy um, few weeks and are getting used to this new way of working. Um, so we have a fairly gentle um, sheet next week to do to kind of give you a little bit of a break. Uh, and I think quite a lot of the third year courses will be like that. We're not going to have we're not going to give up on any of the material, um, but the, you know the weekly work. You've got you've got example sheets in this weekly work to do. So we'll be um, we'll just be hopefully doing stuff as a bit uh, you know kind of fun, and hopefully this one will also be fun as well. Uh, I know I may have a you may disagree with me about my definition of fun, but there we go. Um, and I've got a few questions from you on Piazza, um, so I haven't got round to answering those yet, but I will do soon. Uh, please note that I have uh, uploaded um, a new version of the typed up notes onto Blackboard, and you should refer to those for the week five work. Um, I put in some some uh, a bit of data uh, about the anomalous dispersion that, that we've been uh, talking about last week and this week. Okay, so let's dive into the um, dive into the week four problems. So question one was um, about uh, proton acceleration. So if we were to draw a picture, our proton is being accelerated by a static voltage, we might say, a static voltage of 700 kilovolts. So that's our proton moving along. So we know that if it crosses that voltage, then it will have a final kinetic energy, which I'm going to denote as K, is going to be equal to 700 keV. So that's how I arrive at, at the final energy. And we also told in this in this question that the proton is accelerated over three meters. 
Now, in reality, as we will see later when we discuss cavities, in reality, uh, a, a voltage of this size, whilst you can create it uh, with a linear accelerator, as I've, as I've said in the question, this is really, we would normally call this a DC acceleration system uh, because we have a single static voltage. It's not alternating. OK, so if you look up what a linear accelerator is, it will look a little different to this. It's not just an, an open space with a voltage inside it. So this would be this is the kind of system you might call a van de Graaff generator. So you, you covered those in first year, the idea of having two charge surfaces. So we can imagine this as being some kind of series of negative charges and we launch a proton in some way from the start. In, in reality, this would be a, some kind of heated gas plasma and a proton will exit and it will accelerate from one end to the other. So that, that's what it looks like. Now, the question here is, how much radiation is emitted as the proton accelerates from rest approximately to 700 keV, of its, which is its final kinetic energy? So we're going to try to write down what it, the total amount, of uh, total amount of energy releases radiation is. So that energy which is released by radiation is clearly going to be the power as a function of time times the amount of time it takes for the proton to go from here to here. So we have to keep track of what we mean by, by our notation. So this is the total energy emitted, U subscript R, and it's power times time. Now, in our case, we know that in this voltage, we're going to say that the voltage gives rise to an electric field E, and that electric field is equal to the voltage divided by the distance. And we can say that that is constant. So it will be equal to the force acting on the charge, which is going to be, um, so we can multiply this as Q times here, okay? Just notice that I've left out that Q in my worked answers, but you get the idea. It's basically, there's a constant force. So therefore there is a constant acceleration, okay? So there, there is a constant acceleration. So we can immediately write down that because P, because the acceleration is a constant, the power is a constant. So we can write down um, A squared T over six pi epsilon naught C cubed. Okay, so I have a constant acceleration. Now, we need to figure out how to get the acceleration and the amount of time Sorry, this should be down here, right? So this is the power here, okay? And this is the time over which we have the acceleration. So these, so this is just a number and this is just a constant value. We need to find out what those two numbers are. So how do we do that? Well, we can use our pre-first year statements about, um, about velocity um, as, a, as a function of uh, distance and the acceleration. So we know that this is S equals three meters. So we can write down V squared equals two AS. So A is equal to V over two S. If we happen to know what V and S are, well, we know that S is three meters. We also know that because we're launching from rest, we can write down V equals AT. So we can write down, if we multiply those two, we have V cubed, we can, yeah, multiply those two top and bottom, V cubed equals two A squared ST. So we can write that down as being two S a squared t. Okay, so remember the job here is to find what a squared t is up here. So a squared t, according to this equation, is equal to v cubed over 2s. So we can replace a squared t with v cubed over 2s. So now we have an expression for ur. So it's still e squared over 6 pi epsilon naught c cubed. That's our prefactor times v cubed over 2s. Now, what are V and S? Well, remember S is the distance over which the charge has moved. So this is our final position of the charge. That's three meters. That's how far we've moved. And V here is our final velocity. That's how we worked it out according to these, these expressions above here. So this is our final velocity, right? Well, what is that final velocity? Well, we say K, the kinetic energy is half, Mass of a proton, V squared, okay, equals, uh, equals E times the voltage. And that's our accelerating voltage at 700 kilovolts, right? So the final velocity, which is what we want, whoop, okay, the final velocity 
is just root 2EV over the mass. And I, I do this all the time. Make sure that you're using the correct mass for the object that you're talking about. This is obviously the proton mass here. So let's substitute that in. So I'll leave that at the top there so you can still see it. Okay. So, so, we, want to, so we wanted to work out, didn't we? I think the question was asking us, calculate the ratio of the radiated energy to the final kinetic energy. Well, that ratio is UR over K. So let's, let's write that in. We've got E squared over six pi epsilon naught C cubed. And the, if we do V squared over two S, then this bit here, that's the radiated energy. And we do one over the kinetic energy. So that's two over MP, the proton mass V squared. And we just, cancel out a few terms, still have the six pi over epsilon naught C cubed, the prefactor V over MPS. Okay, so we know what V is, we know what S is, but now we just need to substitute in that kinetic energy, which is root two EV over MP. So let's write that out, UR over K, the ratio of the radiated energy to the kinetic energy is equal to E squared over six pi epsilon naught MP c cubed so what i've done is i've taken the mp from the right here and i put it into this prefactor we're going to work out how big that number is in a bit i'm going to work out one over s which is the distance traveled and then the velocity i substitute in for what the velocity is it's 2 ev over mp so let's work out what those numbers are the first thing is is this velocity term here well we're going to work out roughly how big it is so i'll leave it to you to calculate these numbers exactly so this is about 10 to the seven. This value one over S of course is about one third. And this prefactor here, now, now I've, that I've included the proton mass is about three times 10 to the minus 27. Okay. So you can see when I combine all those numbers, it's about 10 to the minus 20. That's the answer we're looking for. So what's our interpretation of this? It's telling me that when I accelerate a proton from rest, so remember here is our here is our original statement. I'm accelerating a proton from rest up to a fairly large kinetic energy, around 700 keV. And the question I'm asking is, is the amount of radiation being emitted significant? And the value we've calculated is about 10 to the minus 20. So the answer is no. When a proton is accelerated, up to this energy, very little radiation is emitted. So we don't have to worry about radiation, electromagnetic radiation, when we think about practically accelerating protons. So that's the answer to that first question. Please do ask questions or, or, uh, or if you have any points you want to have clarified, please put them in the chat or, or you can always post them on Piazza later if you like, if you think of them later. So that's our first question. Um, so the ratio of the radiated energies, the radiated energy to the kinetic energy is quite small. So what changes when it, we are thinking about an electron? Would anyone like to sort of post post uh, any comment in the chat, or would you like to shout out if you're feeling uh, feeling not uh, brave or bold? Or... Okay, so our question was, if instead an electron ex is accelerated by a potential difference of 700 kilovolts rather than proton, and it says discuss, discuss why the previous calculation is deficient. Okay, uh, so let's, hi. Uh, sorry, there might be some relativistic considerations since the mass is so less. Exactly. Okay, so let's look back at our calculation. We were calculating well, we calculated what the final velocity was. So we have to keep account, of course, that's a little V up there, and this is our voltage here, okay? You have, to, you have to watch out for that, right? So you can see here that the final velocity of the proton here is of order 10 to the seven meters per second, which of course is much less than C, the speed of light. So we are quite happy to do this whole calculation in classical terms, right? And remember, the other way to work it out is to calculate K over MPC squared. So this is the rest energy of a proton. K over MPC squared is much less than one, right? 
because the rest mass of a proton is the order of one GeV, and we're talking about acceleration energies of the order of one MeV, okay, 700 kV, one MeV, roughly the same. So relativistic effects are not important when talking about the disacceleration of the proton. But as, as, uh, as someone's just pointed out, thank you very much. When we think about the acceleration of an electron, 700 keV is now bigger than MeC squared. Okay, so MeC squared for an electron is 0.511 MeV or 511 keV. These are numbers that you should already know in your head. Okay, well, let's calculate how big of a deal that is. Let's calculate some numbers. So, what is gamma? Well, gamma is 2.4. Look back at the notes if you don't know how to calculate that yet <laughs> off the top of your head. And beta, and remember that with this course, we're doing it the other way around from the way you did it in first year, right? It's one minus one over gamma squared, which is about 0.9, okay? So the consequence of this statement, why are relativistic effects important? Well, you can see that we are having an acceleration to a relativistic velocity. Beta is approaching 0.9 at the end of our acceleration. So therefore, the, the acceleration value is not a constant. Also, m is not a constant. The actual mass that appears in any of our calculations. So our calculation has become more complicated as a consequence. Okay? So we'll leave it at that. It's a more complicated calculation, and it's complicated enough that it's gonna become not interesting. OK, so we're not going to do we're not going to pursue that one any further, but it's an in, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, relationship to make. So the important thing to point out here is that is do figure out whether relativistic effects are going to be important or not when you calculate uh, the radiation that comes out of a charge. Now, shall we shall we go into question two? So question two this week is quite long, but I thought it was interesting. And the reason these two questions appear, by the way, in these examples, and, and, you, and you, um, you may have noticed that these kind of questions come up quite a lot in examinations. OK, so we're going to look at what I think is quite an interesting calculation. This is due to uh, Feynman. All right. And the Feynman lectures, um, he talks about this calculation in a slightly different way. But it's a fundamental calculation and it relates to our description of the atom. And of course, as you know, in an atom, we know that there is there is quantized motion or quantized energy levels, and our canonical atom is going to be the hydrogen atom, of course. So we imagine an electron orbiting the atom, and we know already, of course, from from uh, from previous years, um, that um, the quantum uh, calculation is correct, right, and it's the appropriate one. But of course, we before that came about, people were doing calculations of this sort that I'm about to show you to show why it was that the classical hydrogen atom was impossible. And you probably already know, don't you, that the classical hydrogen atom, the statement that's made is that the atom radiates away all of its energy. And um, if, if it were a purely classical object. So let's try to calculate some scale value for how, uh, how quickly uh, an electron orbiting classically around an atom would radiate its weight, its energy. So this is uh, the last part of section two, you might say, and I think it should be fairly educative. So we are, we are going to imagine an electron moving around the atom, and we're going to assume that we know the distance away that the electron is from the proton, and that's A0, that's the bow radius, and we are going to do a classical calculation as we did before, and I'm going to write it down in its slightly different form. Okay, Q squared, A squared over C cubed. So I'm writing it in this form to explicitly show you the one over the four, one over four pi epsilon naught factor, because in many older textbooks or many, many derivations online where you see this calculation being done, they will use CGS units and this part of the expression on the right is the CGS part. But when we do it here in SI units, as of course, what, which is what we do most of the time, this one over four pi epsilon naught appears. Okay, so that's just there to help you see the relationship between the stuff you see on some online derivations and what we're doing now. All right, 
Now, let's try and do a calculation of the radiation. So the acceleration on the electron, if it's classical, is going to be MeV squared over R. So we don't know what, what V is yet. R, of course, is A0, the bow radius. So watch out between the difference between A, the acceleration, and A0, the bow radius. That's just the, the notation that we often use. So the bow radius, well, we'll come back to that in a second, but we happen to know it's about 0.53 angstroms, right? Uh, and A0 is defined, or it arises from our consideration of uh, that bow radius. It's 4 pi h power squared over MeE squared. Okay, this is our quantum calculation for that bow radius. We can write it down separately as MeC alpha, where alpha is the fine structure constant. So these two expressions are the same. Okay, that's just to remind you. So we also know for, that for a classically moving electron in an atom, we can relate the acceleration to the electrostatic force, which is just E squared over four pi epsilon naught R squared. So R here and here is gonna turn into A zero. So we substitute that in and we cancel out uh, A zero. So we have MeV squared is equal to E squared over four pi epsilon naught A zero. Okay, so we've just gone from this to this expression to this expression. So now we can calculate what V squared is. V squared is equal to E squared over four pi epsilon naught Me A zero. Remember, we're using the electron mass because it's the electron that we're, uh, we're calculating the orbital. Now, my top tip for any calculation like this is calculate numbers as you go. So we know what the electron mass is, we know what the Bohr radius is. Let's just calculate what the velocity is. The first thing we can do is calculate the velocity from this expression, and it should come out to be about 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. That's a fairly high velocity, of course. Okay. But of course, the important statement here is to compare this number with C. And we see straight away that V is much less than C. So despite the fact that the electron is you know, uh, um, orbiting in a very small space around the atom, and we imagine intuitively that it must be moving quite fast, actually the classical calculation demonstrates that the velocity is uh, compatible with a, with a classical description. So this electron is not moving relativistically, it's moving classically. And just for reference, we can calculate beta, which is, as you would imagine, very, very small, about 0 0.0073 or something like that. And therefore, gamma is pretty much one, right? So there's no relativistic increase in the mass of the electron in the hydrogen atom. So now let's put that together with our calculation of the acceleration so we can calculate the power. Okay, so. Let's put that up there. So the acceleration, again, uh, was mv squared over r. So we know what r is now. So it's about, so we know what v and r are, sorry. It's 8.21 times 10 to the minus eight meters per second. So it's a fairly small acceleration because it's a very, very small object uh, moving quite close to an atom, okay? So let's work out what the power is. So the power, um, let's work out what the power is. Blah, 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 blah. Well, let's work out the power. We'll, we'll keep it analytical for a little bit. We'll keep it in terms of its, uh, its symbols. One over four pi epsilon naught, two thirds. And of course, we're going to uh, replace Q, the charge, with E. So it should be E squared, A squared over C, C cubed. And remember that A now is equal to E squared over four pi epsilon naught, A naught squared, okay? Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. So if we substitute in for the acceleration, so you have to keep track of all your keep track of all your uh, e's. Okay, it comes to be there's an e squared factor there. And we've got a. Um, uh, I put the c cubed over here. Okay, and I've got e to the fourth. I've just squared the acceleration, and that's this term on the right. So it's got 16 pi squared, epsilon naught squared a naught to the fourth, okay? So you need to just, just keep track of all these epsilon naughts. That's often what disappears from these expressions when you're, not take, when, you're, when you're not being careful. So that's the power, okay? And we'll also write down what the kinetic energy is for reference, half mv squared. Remember, v is classical, so this expression is true. 
and we'll write down the potential energy for uh, an electron in a hydrogen atom, minus e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught a0. So let's write down what some of these numbers are. So before we do that, let's also write down some other things about, about, the, um, about this electron. We should probably also calculate how long it takes for the electron to go around the atom. Well, that's just 2 pi a0 over the velocity. Okay. So we can calculate t squared. We'll see why that's important to calculate as t squared in a minute. t squared equals 4 pi squared a0 squared over v squared. Aha, because we've got v squared, we can relate that to the v squared we had earlier on. Okay. We've got that from knowing the energy of the electron. Okay, so we can substitute in that v squared. So we substitute that in here. And now we have the period squared. It just makes it a little easier to calculate. It's 16 pi cubed, okay, epsilon naught m a naught cubed over e squared. So you can see this looks similar to our sort of orbital stuff. You know, t squared is proportional to distance cubed. Okay. So our electron period, t, is 1 over e square root, okay, so I've got 1 over e there, 16 pi cubed, okay, e naught m e 0 cubed, okay. So I'm not going to ask you to do a calculation this involved, by the way, in an exam, right? This is, this is just a, should be an, just an interesting calculation, okay. So that comes out to be 1.5 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds, in other words, about 0.15 femtoseconds. So it doesn't take long for the electron to go around, but it is moving classically. And let's carry on. So this has all gone through step by step in the, in, in, the, uh, in the notes. Now let's just take a moment. Let's look at that T, that period, right? That's a we can relate that to the frequency of the, um, of the electron orbit. So the frequency of the electron orbit is about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 15 hertz. Why might that be interesting if we have a classically moving electron orbiting an atom? Any, anyone want to shout out? What might we expect would be the nature of the radiation coming out? So we've got an electron orbiting when viewed from the side and it's radiating. Anyone, anyone care to shout out? I think it should be a gamma radiation. Well, we, 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 we may calculate that. Um, that's a good question where, where gamma ray, what, what the definition of a gamma ray is. I'll come back, that, come back to that in a second, actually. That's, that's a good question to ask. Well, let's look at that. So remember what we said about the nature of electromagnetic radiation from charges moving in a circle. Okay, so I'm viewing a charge moving in a circle, which is what our electron is doing. And we're going to view from the side. And from the side, it looks like a small charge moving left and right. So that's our Hertzian dipole idea. And you can see that if it's moving left and right, the radiation that's emitted when viewed from this side, and that's it's going to be true from any side, right? The radiation being emitted will be of a frequency which is equal to the frequency of the oscillation. So this is the frequency of the, of the oscillation. It's six times 10 to the 15 Hertz. So therefore, if that radiation was made of photons, right? We're assuming, of course, that uh, that the, um, that the radiation can be emitted for a long period of time to emit many photons of the same frequency. Of course, that's not true here because the, because the electron is reducing in energy, but it's nevertheless interesting to calculate, to relate this frequency to the, uh, the energy of those photons. So we calculate what HF is. It's 4.4 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, and that's 27 EB or thereabouts. Now notice, that's about twice the ionization energy of hydrogen. Right? There's a reason why it's twice, but it's clear that this frequency here is related to the quantum nature of the emission of the radiation. There is a relationship between this classical picture and this quantum picture. Okay. I thought that, I thought that was interesting. Now, let's calculate that power one more time. So we laboriously do it again, it's one over four pi epsilon naught, okay, two thirds Q squared A squared over C cubed. 
And if we substitute in for our acceleration over here and we work it all out, it's 10 to the minus 42 watts. OK, so that sounds like a small amount of power, but, it, but it only, the electron only had a small amount of energy to begin with. How can we do an interesting calculation of that? Well, let's calculate um, um, let's calculate the, the amount of energy emitted per orbit. Okay, so the delta E per orbit, remembering that one orbit is 0.15 femtoseconds. Well, it's 10 to the minus 42 times uh, 0.15 uh, femtoseconds. Okay, which is that's power times time is about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 24 joules. Let's convert that into more convenient unit. It's about 41 nano EV. Okay, very, very small. Sorry, I'm 10 to the 27 joules, 27 joules, not 24, 27. It's 41 nano EV. So it's a, so a tiny amount of EVs per orbit. So we can see straight away because if the electron energy is of the order of EVs, then we're going to get um, 10 to the 8 orbits or so before the electron loses all of its energy. So we can see by eye that we've got about 10 to the 8 orbits. But let's calculate that properly. Let's calculate the kinetic energy of the electron, which is e squared over 8 pi epsilon naught a0. Okay, that comes from the virial theorem. Let's calculate that as a number. It's 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And hey, presto, as you might expect, that's 13.6 EV. Okay, the same as in our quantum calculation. So we're going to compare the kinetic energy that the electron has to start with to the energy it's losing per turn. So K over delta E is about three times 10 to the eight. So that's the number of orbits an electron makes before it loses all of its energy. Okay, so clearly it's going to change the amount of energy it, it, it releases as it orbits, but it gives us a scale value for that for that time. So remember the orbit time was 0.15 femtoseconds. So now we can write down a classical calculation, okay, which is the typical time that an electron lasts when orbiting an electron. A, a, a proton in a hydrogen atom is something like K over delta E times T, which is of the order of five times 10 to the minus seven seconds, okay? So you can see this classical calculation has given us a rough number, which allows us to state how long an electron will reside in a particular energy level or a particular energy situation. And there is a relationship between this classical calculation and the lifetimes of electrons uh, in atoms if they're in an excited state. Okay? This classical ca calculation is relevant in, in working out the lifetimes of electrons. So if I have an, an, an excited electron in an atom, I would expect it to last of the order of 10 to the minus 7 seconds before it uh, radiates away a photon. Now, this calculation is deficient again. We've done, we've done a rough calculation because we already know that delta E, the energy emitted, varies as a function of the electron energy. The acceleration will vary. So if we imagine a classical calculation, the, as, the, as the electron spirals in towards the center of the atom, then the acceleration and therefore the power will vary as a function of time. So this calculation is a simple first step towards that, but it gives us a rough idea. When we do it properly, it turns out to be a little shorter than this. Okay? So we've done, a, we've done a first calculation, but P varies with R. And if you have a look in the Feynman lectures, it shows you a more, uh, a more um, uh, concrete calculation of that. Okay. Um, okay, so I've seen a few questions online. Yeah, hi Ravi, so do yeah. you have a question? Yes, a quick, quick, a quick question. Um, since the velocity uh, keeps changing as the particle starts spiraling inwards, wouldn't the angular momentum of the particle remain a constant? And that would be the constant of motion, I think, right? 
Uh, yes, we, I haven't mentioned angular momentum at all. I just completely ignored that. I'm merely looking at the radiation part of our calculation. That's uh, a good thing to calculate. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was doing this most on the uh, with the aim of calculating the the exact time because then you would have to run an integral over the entire space and and you could use the angular momentum as as a constant of the motion. Uh, yes, you could. You could do that. Yes. I'm uh, okay. So the, the way I'm the reason I'm introducing it in this way is is calculating this rate of uh, energy release as a function of time as the electron spirals in is a bit fiddly. I'm starting. I'm starting with a simpler calculation here, so that we can calculate what the initial rate of energy loss is. You can see here to make it more tractable, to make it easier to follow. I'm calculating the energy change per orbit and then calculating the actual energy loss in the same kind of units that we're used to so i'm saying that each orbit i'm getting about 41 nano ev released compared to the initial kinetic energy of about 13 ev so this allows us to, to do a first calculation of the time you're absolutely right that later on that you can calculate how this varies and it will modify this equation Okay, it'll, it'll modify this amount of time, All right? Now, um, but I think it's valuable to start with this calculation because I think if you do it, if you do the, if you do it all in one step, and you calculate the rate of change of the, uh, the rate of change of the power as a function of time, and you do that integral, you can lose sight of this simpler idea of how much energy is actually being lost per orbit. Now, the reason I the reason I show this is because one of the other situations we talk about. So there, I'm not talking about this on the um, on the worked answers, but let's 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 talk about this for a second. So later on in section six, we're going to talk about two other situations, one of which is the radiation of il, of uh, electrons in a magnetron. So these are classically moving electrons. So they're similar to what we were talking about in terms of the hydrogen atom. But now, instead of having a nucleus, a proton in the center, we now have a magnetic field. So this is now a macroscopic device. So we'll be looking at these later on in the course. And in this situation, the calculation we're doing is the rate of power emission from the electrons. But now the electrons reach a steady state and the same amount of energy is fed into them as is released. Similarly, in a storage ring, this is a, so these things have typical dimensions of centimeters, by the way. They're roughly centimeters in size. Another situation is an electron in a storage ring. So these electrons might have an energy of maybe one GeV, so obviously a lot larger than in our hydrogen atom. And they orbit in magnetic fields, which are of the order of one Tesla. And again, they emit radiation, but now because the electrons are much higher in energy, the electrons are now moving relativistically and they will emit radiation in a different manner. And again, in this situation, we can calculate the amount of energy loss per orbit, delta E orbit, and we can compare that to the electron energy itself, which in this case is something like, the delta E is something like one MeV per orbit typically. So you can see that an electron in one of these large objects, so that these things are something like 100 meters in size that's that's a site that's the kind of size we're talking about right? so these are real physical things and we'll show you pictures and things like that later on and we can see that again we can do a rough calculation of how long an electron will last when orbiting one of these things and here we can see it's about 1000 orbits yeah because well, one one mev per orbit it's 1000 orbits in reality we don't let the electrons last we don't let the electrons last um, uh, without without doing anything to them. We just don't, we don't let them just spiral inwards as they would do in a classical atom. What we do is we feed in energy, we feed in a voltage into the electrons, and we reaccelerate them so that the electron energy is basically constant. Okay, this is one of the reasons why we're talking about the reacceleration through a voltage. That was question number one today, right? We were asking how much energy is released from by radiation when we accelerate something in, in, a, in a straight line. This is different, isn't it? Here we have an acceleration at right angles. Okay. So again, our radiation is emitted. And uh, 
uh, because the electron is moving relativistically, it has a different form. So this will be synchrotron radiation. You can look ahead to look at that. So all three cases that we looked at are sort of the same. So we're, calc we're, we're doing calculations which are sort of scale sizes. Now, we'll, we'll come back and we will do a later question where we'll, where we'll look at uh, that fuller calculation of the classical radiating atom. I, I know it's going to be of interest to a lot of people. So we will come back to that. OK. Now, a couple of other questions on the chat. So, yes, if we if we imagine. Here is our here is our hydrogen atom one more time. So here is our electron moving around. And if we observe the electron orbiting from the side, if only we could arrange it so the electron was orbiting one way, right? We would see a different amount of radiation being emitted in different directions. This is our classical picture, okay? So a single hydrogen atom, if it happened to be classically orbiting in some plane, we would see linearly polarized light. The light would be polarized linearly when viewed from the side. And as you, would, as you have correctly pointed out, it would be circularly polarized when viewed from above, okay? Remembering, of course, that here is our classical picture. Here is our, uh, our acceleration is, uh, so this is the axis of rotation. So our acceleration is inwards, okay? So here is our electron orbiting. The electron is moving like this. And as it's accelerating, it emits radiation, which is in a donut shape this way. Okay, so there's no radiation towards the center, right? And the radiation is emitted in a donut, so there's no radiation emitted outwards or inwards, but there is front to back and above and below. Okay. Okay, so we see circularly polarized radiation when viewed from above. So that's our electron. Now, because we don't know the orientation of any particular hydrogen atom, we'll see an averaging out over many over all the directions, all the different directions of our of our hydrogen atoms. If we're viewing this in a classical picture, so we don't expect to see any of this sort of this classical effect manifesting itself in a measurement. But we do see this with uh, nuclei radiating. So I think that was one of the other questions. Let's let's just look at that. So. We saw, we've done a calculation. So here is, our, uh, here is our electron orbiting at some distance A0 around a proton in the nucleus. And we saw that if we calculated the, how long the electron lasted, it had a, a, rough, a rough time of 10 to the minus seven seconds. And this produces photons who have an energy which is of the order of 10 EV, okay? And this goes with a scale size, A0, of the order of one angstrom. That was our rough scale size. Now we imagine something else. We imagine a nucleus. Now the force is different. So here we have a nucleus composed of protons and neutrons, and we imagine one proton, orbiting inside that nucleus. So it, it's confined to some space. And that space there, that size, is of the order of one femtometer. And by a similar calculation, we can work out that the typical lifetime of a proton, an excited proton in, an, in a nucleus, will be about 10 to the five times smaller. It'll be about 10 to the minus 12 seconds or thereabouts. Okay. And the typical gamma ray energy that we, will, that we will obtain from that is of the order of one MeV. Okay. So there might be a factor of a few when, when I convert from one to the other. So these are atoms on the left, okay, and these are nuclei on the right. So these are uh, photons, and the very high energy ones would be X-rays, and conventionally we call these ones on the right gamma rays, don't we? Okay, so X-rays come from, at, from electrons in atoms and gamma rays come from charges inside the nucleus. So that's the difference between, the, between those two situations. But we can do, a, we can do a, a classical calculation in both cases, and we can derive from that the typical energies of emission of, uh, of, of uh, the photons that either come from an atom or come from a nucleus, which I think is pretty cool. I think it's a pretty cool calculation. Okay, does that, uh, does that answer everyone's questions?
Yeah, cool. Okay. So remember that, folks. Gamma rays come from nuclei and they have energies much larger. And by working out the acceleration and, and the frequency of orbit, we can obtain classically what the energy of a gamma ray is. And it's exactly the same as we did for what that we've just done for a hydrogen atom. Yeah, we can figure out what the energies of a photon are from a classical calculation. I personally think that's a really cool calculation. Hopefully you, hopefully you all agree that as well. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. So we've left behind um, our discussion of radiation. We're now looking into um, the dispersion relation. So we're looking at real materials. So hopefully you've gone through some of that stuff already. And this question is really, this is a repetition really of example sheet three, but I just thought I'd go through, um, you know, live what our dispersion relation is. Okay, so what is our dispersion relation? Our dispersion relation arises from Maxwell's equations. So when we put real conductivity and real permittivity and permeability in a material into Maxwell's equations, we end up with a relationship that looks like this. So this is the general form of the dispersion relation. And what is it telling me? It's telling me that if I have an electromagnetic wave in a real material, and that electromagnetic wave has a frequency omega, it tells me the wavelength k. Okay, well, the wave number here, but of course you can convert that into a wavelength. The important difference when I have conductivity is that this term on the right becomes non-zero, and it's this term here that gives rise to loss, because this term makes k complex valued, and if it's complex valued, then I have energy loss or I have amplitude loss as a function of distance through the material. So this is the important difference. So this is the conductivity part, and you can see that I've, I've divided the dispersion relation into the free space bit, which is this. So that's what happens in a vacuum. This is a reduction in speed of the wave, which of course, for a given frequency, changes the wavelength or therefore the wave number and this is the lost part so we look at three situations and it's these are these are good to practice they come up again and again in exams in a dielectric i've got no conductivity and i have a relative permeability of one so it's a non-magnetic dielectric pretty much all dielectrics are non-magnetic and hey presto this immediately simplifies to k equals omega over c root epsilon r. That's easy, isn't it? So what does it tell me? It tells me that, um, that uh, the speed of a wave reduces by a factor at root epsilon r. Okay. In a poor conductor, these are what, you, these are what you, we, I often call bread and butter calculations, right? And what do we mean by a poor conductor? Well, a poor conductor means sigma is small, and, when, and the important thing is small in comparison to what? Well, clearly it's in comparison to the denominator underneath. So our statement of what a poor conductor is, is sigma over epsilon r, epsilon naught, omega is much less than one, all right? And you can see straight away that, that if we assume that sigma is a constant over, over overall frequencies, then you can see that whether or not a substance is a poor conductor depends on the frequency of the wave. So it's not, so a poor conduct, our statement poor conductor, it, um, substances can be poor conductors at some frequencies and good conductors at other frequencies. So we have to be aware of that when we, when we use this calculation. Quite often, quite often say metals will have a single conductivity that, that applies over a large range of frequencies. And that's what we'll normally assume. We'll, we'll normally assume that sigma is a constant. And again, if you look in the notes, you, you can write down that K, because, because this term up here is small, we can write this expression when we take the square root. Okay, we bring the we bring a half down and we can see straight away it's omega over C, okay, root epsilon r, uh, epsilon r mu r. It might be, it might be magnetic, but normally it's not. And then it's one minus I sigma over two epsilon R epsilon naught omega. So you can see here I have weak because this term here is small. I have a lot of oscillation and very little damping. That's what that's what poor conductor means. It's slightly counterintuitive. 
OK, just to finish off the good conductor situation. And we'll see how this manifests itself this week. So the good conductor. Sigma over epsilon r epsilon naught omega is much bigger than one. And then when we look back at our expression, we see that it's it's this term here that's small. This the magnitude of this complex part is much bigger than that one. So now I can write down that k squared is approximately equal to minus i sigma mu r mu naught omega. And now everything looks completely different. K equals omega over C because I move around mu naught and epsilon naught to get a whole of a C. So I can write down the vacuum part of the speed and it's root minus I sigma mu R over omega epsilon naught in there. Okay. And that's one way of writing it. So you can see I still have this vacuum bit and I have this absorptive bit. Okay. And again, if you look through the notes, I can write that down as root mu r, mu naught, sigma omega. And then I have this funny factor, e to the seven i pi by four, right? I've written down root of minus i in this form, and I can rewrite that as um, one over root two, one minus i, okay? With this same factor there. And then I move things around, I move the root two over there. So now I have k is mu naught, sigma omega, over two, because I've just I've decided that it's not magnetic. One minus i. Okay, so that's what k is. And the important thing here is I've got two parts here. I've got kr, whose magnitude is this, and I've got a ki, whose magnitude is also this, and they're basically equal to each other, which means that I I propagate into the material, into this metal, this conductor, with this with nearly the same wavelength as it's being absorbed. There's a factor two pi difference because the phase goes as e to the minus k r i z and the amplitude goes as e to the minus k i z, yeah, the real part and the imaginary part. And from that, we have the notion of the skin depth, right, which is just one over k i, okay, which is equal to root two over mu naught sigma omega. So in the, in the, um, in the next example sheet, we'll do a we'll do a, uh, a couple of calculations of that uh, of that uh, skin depth. Okay, so that's it. Uh, again, all the uh, answers are on the uh, on Blackboard, and uh, good luck with uh, this uh, with this week's work. Okay. Cheers. See you all later. Uh, all questions on the chat was normal. Cheers. Um, sorry, could I just ask you a quick question? Um, sure. Or, or uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, what does the imaginary part of K really represent? Is it is it because I mean, K would represent the uh, the wavelength, right, of this wave that's going into the dielectric medium. So yes. Uh, so would the imaginary part is KI? Yeah. Yes. KI represents the absorption. Mm -hmm. Or the reduction, well, sorry, Ki does not represent the absorption. Ki represents the reduction in the electric field as a function of depth. Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to that more formally later on. Uh, but Ki is just is, is the amplitude of the electric field. Okay. Sorry, it's not absorption because there is no absorption. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said absorption. It's the reduction in the reduction in the electric field. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. I'll, and, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that in the notes because but it, but it is in the notes and uh, if you send me an email uh, so it's put, put yeah, that's a comment in I'll point people to the specific lines where that's pointed out okay yeah uh, and yeah there was another question on Pietza which was about the uh, derivation of the electric field in the in the case of the half wave antenna uh, yes I haven't answered that yes and I will do later yeah all right great thank you have a nice day okay cheers Rudy. cheers cheers bye